Hi, I'm Marion Jones, and I'm looking at this picture that Torrance did of me in 1981. I met Torrance many years ago through a friend called James Murray, and we would stop over and look at his pictures. And he decided one day, he said, I'd like to take a, a, a painting of you. And so I'm sitting down here, and he's talking, and we're all talking. I can't believe this picture, really. To me, I don't look anything like it now. <laughs> but Torrance was a great artist. And I'm glad to put this on loan with the museum. My name is Deborah Joy and I feel honored to be here with the beautiful artists and artwork representing Baltimore City. Thank you. Hi, my name is Victor Holliday and I'm delighted to be here tonight for the Baltimore Masters. I think this is a kind of exhibit that has taken way too long actually to come about. And I'm here not only to celebrate all these great warriors of profound insight and vision and beauty and artistry but also to support a personal friend of mine, Pontella Mason, uh, who was both a friend and a neighbor. And exhibits like this need to happen more often, and what a wonderful treasure we have in just the works that are sampled by those masters who are represented here tonight. So I hope that in the future that there is some way that we can see an even wider collection and open this up to a national and perhaps even international audience, because Baltimore masters are to be celebrated. Hi, I'm Vanita Gardner, and I'm just here taking in the evening, uh, enjoying the art, enjoying the stories, talking to the families, meeting new people. Um, it's quite a community celebration. Good evening. My name is Rachel Wood, and this wonderful picture here to my left is my gorgeous, delightful, loving mother, Marion Jones. The picture is named Rio. I remember as a young kid when she came home with this picture, I was a little surprised at first. Uh, as you can see, uh, the picture shows itself in its entirety. But as the years grew, it grew on me, and I loved the picture to this very day. This was back in 81, so today my mom is 77 years old, and she is just as beautiful today as she was then. Thank you. of my neighbor, but I also know several of the artists here, and this is a wonderful exhibit. To see black art is something that I have aspired for for many years. I'm just glad to see the venue is so beautiful. I am here tonight to look at the wonderful artworks that are being displayed. It's good to have these types of paintings and medias available that show the African-American community and the positivity of the artists who so often don't get recognized. The paintings are absolutely fantastic. They're so complex and some are so simplistic, but they touch the heart. Each one of us that comes in here can get a feeling from the art that we see as part of our everyday life. It's absolutely beautiful. 
Yes, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Leon Bailey, and I um, had an invitation this evening uh, to be here by Mr. Poncho Brown. It really was just a coincidence uh, how I got the invitation. I was over at Carver High School, and I was about to leave, and I went into the office, and who was there but Poncho? And Poncho said, Mr. Leon, Mr. Leon. Well, he said Mr. Leon because Poncho's father and I wrestled together at Carver High School in 1950, what, 59, that, that era. And that was the connection. I was so glad to see him. I hadn't seen him in years. Uh, as a matter of fact, I saw him last week on television. I think it was, I'm not going to say what station, I don't remember, but he was talking about his artwork that he was doing. And here I am, just a coincidence today, to meet up with him. And he told me about his show tonight uh, here at uh, Frederick Douglass Museum. And I said to myself, I had to, I have to come. I had to come to support him. And while we were there at Carver, we were talking about some other things, naturally about his father, who was a great wrestler, a great artist in himself, you know. So uh, other than that, that's basically it. You know, we were talking about, like I say, his father's wrestling, my wrestling at Carver High School, one of the greatest schools in, in, in the United States, one of the greatest schools in the United States and one of the greatest coaches, wrestling coaches at Carver, Mr. Charlie Robinson. And I had to also had to tell him about, you see, you, you notice this hat I got on, but if you notice, it says Navy Wrestling. Navy Wrestling, and I wrestled for the Navy for two years. Two years, and I also coach. And I'm going to give you some information. This ain't got nothing to do with art, but since I have the mic, you know, one thing you're not supposed to do, give people a mic. You're not supposed to give people a mic. But anyway, I'm going to go on. I want you to know that my wrestling for the Navy, I just received uh, a confirmation letter in 2014 that I was the first African-American to win a New England State Championship. In 1964, that same championship in 1964, I had an invitation to the 64 Olympic trials. And also, I want to let you know that I was inducted into Carver's Hall of Fame in 2000. That's enough for me, but more than anything, I'm glad that I met with Poncho today. The work that I see, the exhibits here of the masters, and they are really masters, are really great. Thank you for letting me take up your time. collected all of these wonderful pieces of work 
we said, let's make it happen. And let's make it happen in Black History Month so that we can celebrate all of who we are and whose we are. And we're just grateful to have you all here. And today, we had over 200 children wow. who walked through the door. But it's his strength and his creativity that got us to this place. And I know that he has a catalog that he's creating. I really would ask you all to sign your name and order the catalog. That catalog is a piece, it's a collector's item. And you need to be able to have that. You know, I'm, my daughter says, you always tell people what you, they need to do. <laughs> Y'all need to do it. You need to do it because it's that information, the documentation. This is one experience. But you need to have that documentation as a takeaway. Your children, your grandchildren, need to be able to see that catalog because they're not here today. Hopefully you'll bring them, but then that's something that you will be able to remember all of this by, because who knows if we'll ever be able to see these pieces of work again in life. Let's think about that. They're in private collection. Yeah. And so in order to preserve this, we have to create our legacy through the maintenance of that catalog. So without further ado, please welcome Larry Poncho Brown. Don't make me get emotional. I want to thank each and every one of you for showing up today. Uh, I have so much I want to say, so hopefully I won't start preaching. Okay. You want a chair? But I have a lot I want to say. I have a lot I want to say because this is very important. Uh, two years ago. I decided to do an exhibition here in Baltimore at the Baltimore Downtown Culture Center where we invited all the living artists that we could find to participate in that show. And a lot of the artists here, Lisa Nathaniels here, Jerry Prittiman, there was a whole host of artists that was in that show, Tommy Roberts, and I won't mention everybody because it's just, it's just going to slow things down. Uh, we had 40 artists show up for that. We had 40 individual works by 40 artists from Baltimore in that show. Right after that, I thought about conceptualizing this because uh, this is so important because often works are left behind and we don't know what to do with them. Nobody in this city has ever done a show committed to the African American artists of Baltimore City. Wow. That's what? a crime. That's a crime. And without being too preachy, we got some hellified institutions here in Baltimore. Yes. You know, you got the 1800s, 1820s, you're talking about the Maryland History College of Art. They were around before the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Walters, okay? We also had, and I mentioned these because these are all landmark institutions, the Afro newspaper was around before all of them. And you got Carver Senior High School, that's the only place that a lot of Hello. us could go to learn. Carver, Carver, I'm going to tell Carver right too. I mentioned those names because each one of these artists is stitched together by one of those institutions. And without them, they would have no name. But beyond that, if you take out your fanciest phone and Google these people, you will find it's not a lot of information out there. And that's our fault. That's right. It's not the Walters' fault. It's not the BMA's fault. It's our fault. When I tried to find, and I'll talk about some of the artists as we go along, Robert Torrance is a genius. Now, if any of you knew him, this man used to watch two TV sets while listening to music, yes. painting on an easel, and reading a book Whoa. at the same time. Yes. And then if you asked him what's happening on all of them, he would tell you because he believed that you could feed the brain as much information as it could take. Nobody knows about Robert Torrance. He worked at the University of Maryland as a medical illustrator for 30 years. 20 of those years, he was the only African American on the staff. So we, each one of these people are landmark people that we need to embrace. This man had a studio right on Jasper, right behind the Afro newspaper. He was a photographer, he was a musician, he was so many things, but if you try to find information on him, if you notice I don't have a birth date and a death date, it's because it's that difficult to find information on him. And he knew a lot of the artists on the walls in here. The oldest member on the wall is Elizabeth Talford Scott, Scott. 
She is the only person in this room who has been in the collections of the BMA and the Walters. Out of 15 artists in this room, she's the only one. Tom Miller is one of the most popular artists yes. in the African American realm. He was a landmark person in so many subjects. Talking about the subject of AIDS, he was an activist before there were any activists. We knew it, and every time we drive past North Avenue, some of us smile because they've made it a priority to make sure his work is preserved. Fontella Mason, how many of you drove up Rice's Town Road and saw that yellow mural with the African face and the wave behind it? Mm -hmm. You're talking about a lot of folks that have put history here that you drive by every day and take for granted. His wife is standing right there. She helped him paint that mural. Wave your hand. I could go around a room and pull out certain people, but it would take way too long. How can you forget about Thomas Stockett? The Afro newspaper has been around since who knows how long, 1800, started by a slave, John Murphy Sr., at a time when most of us weren't reading. They were in 13 states. They're now in two. If it wasn't for the actions of the Afro, None of these artists would be depicted. Their only his the most history you're going to find about Thomas Stockett is through the Afro. But here you go. You know, I'm going to call out people where they need to be called out. As I tried to get this collection together, there's one important point you guys need to know when you look at this work. Everything on the walls here was submitted by someone's personal collection. Yeah. I called the Afro, who owned 10 of Stock Tommy Stockett's works. Not one piece was submitted. What? I called the family of Thomas Stockett. He has six daughters and a living sister that's 92 years old. Not one piece. I tried to find pieces of Torrance. I don't want to call, but a Baltimore artist inherited his work. I could not get one piece. So everything in here was given by somebody that saw the importance of at least loaning. Black folks. We are behind Jeez. the game. Yes, we are. We are harboring and hoarding. I can't tell you people that I walked up to and said, they, they brag about their work. And then I always ask this question, would you be willing to show it in the school? Oh, hell no, I'm going to keep my stuff. No, they, I, they, I, don't go what? It is common. So every person that put a piece in this show, if you put a piece in this show, please raise your hand so people can see you. If you own it and you're not willing to share it, then something's wrong with you. You're yes. not going to keep it forever. You're just holding it in history. That's right. We complain that our works are not represented in the museums around town. Think about that now. Because while we're talking, the BMA and the Walters have works by African American artists that you probably won't see until Black History Month. And if you go right now, probably won't see anything, because if they slip by, they slip by. Mm -hmm. I was invited to speak at the Walters a year ago. That's right. They wasted money. They had me come in. I submitted a <coughs> proposal to do a lecture on the history of Baltimore artists. I was willing to get up in front of the podium, in front of the stage, for the same money they gave me to sit at a six-foot table with my work on easels. They had nobody there to document this, this effort and wrote me a very good check. And there was one man in this room who has dedicated himself to document now history, and if you don't know him, shame on you, and that's Mr. Beasley. He is the reason why that got documented and is online today. So we have to be champions for this work. There's so many horror stories going on with this work. Jasmine Cryer is in the back, raise your hand. Curry Beth Cryer was a photographer for, come on, she did the Afro. She learned at Coppin State. She started teaching at Coppin State. They had the nerve to name a museum after her. And still, many of us have not heard from her. And they're still not, even though they named the museum after her, her daughter's having time trying to put together a show of her works. The BMA has done a couple of things with her. But often, they sweep it under the carpet. 
Elizabeth Telford Scott, for instance. You're talking about pre-segregation. You're talking about tyrants. They came along at a time when black people could not even go to the Maryland Institute College of Arts. We got two artists in this show who were the very first class of black people to go to Micah. Tom Miller and Joy Scott, the daughter of Elizabeth Chopper Scott. There's a lot of history right in this room. If you don't know these artists, it's why I took the time to print that thing out so you can have something at home. Because it's a lot of folks that fall through the cracks. Tommy's piece, Tommy Stockett, was donated by Kevin Brown. Everybody know Kevin Brown here in Baltimore? Yeah. Okay, Kevin's crazy. When I first asked Kevin, could I get the piece? <laughs> Kevin said, oh no, that's my mama. You can't, but when he heard what we were trying to do, Kevin Brown gave me that piece. It had not been out of his house in 20 years. Wow. It's that moment where you have to recognize, is it time? Yes. Jasmine has all of her mother's work and been trying to figure out what to do with this. If it wasn't for the fact that I begged her, she pulled this piece off her wall. Okay? For you guys to see it. So if you don't rally behind her to help her when she puts together this, something's wrong with y'all. Now we walk around, we talk about our art collections, we talk like we know what's happening in Baltimore. How many of you know every artist on the wall in here? Thank you. Sometimes you can think you know a lot, with the exception of a few people. If you don't know everybody in this room, shame on you. Uh, Mikey Jones. How many of y'all drove down Gwen's Falls to Garrison Boulevard and saw that man set up selling artwork? And y'all either drove past him laughing or you stopped and you bought a print from him. That wasn't for him. That was for y'all. He's a Baltimore legend. Because it comes in all ways. We can talk about the notoriety of artists. It's really not about the notoriety. If you're a critic in this room now and you want to assess this work on what the merits of that, 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 that get out of here. This show is not for you. This show is for you guys to see Baltimore history because I was one of the people who badmouthed Baltimore all the time until I started traveling and realized, you know what? We ain't doing too bad in Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> we need to stop complaining and we need to start. I'm going to tell you the funniest story. Please, I'm trying not to jump around. With every time you do a movement like this, there are people that get it and people that don't get it. I got an email immediately when I first promoted this show from a woman, bless her heart, and her comment was, and it was, I can't use the words because it's, it's, you know, it might be some children in the room. <laughs> but I'm a paraphrase. Must you have male parts in order to be equally represented? Why are you dividing the artists? There's a disparity between the amount of men artists and women artists in your show. Think about that for a minute. I mean, if I could have killed me five more women artists to make it equal, I would have did it. But I just want you to see the mentality it takes when you're trying to even do something positive. You know, I'm right now rallying to get as many Baltimore artists as I can to meet me on the steps of the BMA on April the 2nd. That's a joke, too. Because I put it on Facebook just to see if y'all would find it. I get a call from the BMA. What are you doing? <laughs> Say, I'm thinking about gathering all the artists, stand on the steps, take a photograph. Oh, really? So what made you think about using the BMA? I'm on a conference call with three people. Do you know they sent me an application for $500 for us to stand on the steps? Don't look, don't look surprised. When you want, if you want to talk about disparities in art, I'm here to tell you what they are. I've been a professional artist my whole life. This man gave me his talent. He couldn't even, he had no opportunities as an artist. He had me when he was 16 years old. He had to give up his dream to take care of me, okay? He was at Carver Senior High School with Chanel Alford and a bunch of other people in this room. He got so frustrated with art and the lack of outlets for art that he went into printing. But he also taught in the school system in vocational education for over 30 years. He had no outlet. This painting right here, can you imagine a five-year-old child watching somebody construct this from the very beginning to the end? 
So if y'all wonder why I'm so militant, it's my father's fault. <laughs> right, yeah. He was challenging the notion of a white Jesus Christ even in 1968 when this painting was created. And you see a lot of that. We don't know the history, so we are numb to it. We, if we don't know what it is, we're kind of ignorant. We walk away and we look for the stuff we know. How many, how many of y'all did that when you came in here today? No, look for the ones you don't know. Okay, Fill the brain with new information. So I thank you so much for coming out. I could get more into this. Hopefully, if you have any questions, you can uh, talk to me, and I'll try to highlight you as much as I can. I try to talk about each one of the artists. Uh, there are some people I need to know. I talked about the second generation thing, but Mr. Lee is here. He is the father. Raise your hand now. It's another one of our warriors. He's the father of Cornell Barnes. Oh. Okay. I want to talk about Cornell Barnes a little bit, too, because if you Google him right now, you can't find nothing. I had to search down obituary records to find information on him. Okay? That's how bad it is. Cornel Bond was commercially successful artist in this region, but what happened was with the big influx of African American art in the 70s and the 80s, one of his pieces that depicted the Last Supper, where he'd use all black heroes, yeah. went crazy yeah. all over the world. Yeah. Am I right? That's, right? That's right. Did your son get compensated for that? No, he did not. They made millions of dollars off of those images, and Cornell didn't see much of any of it. And I want to thank Miss Morgan. Where is she? She's still here? There's Carolyn Morgan, and there's a Gwendolyn Morgan. They're sisters, and they own two of those pieces. They gave those pieces to us to exhibit. So is anybody here you want to know a little bit about before I close this off? Because I know there's so much I want to say. I hope I touch ground. Leslie King Hammond is in the backbone of this. Let me tell you the heroes in Baltimore City that you should know if you don't know them. Leslie King Hammond is the most powerful African American woman on the East Coast, and I challenge you, in the United States, with African American history and art history. Without her efforts, she's powerful. That piece, the very first piece on the back wall on the right-hand side is by O'Neill Hammond. That's where Leslie got the Hammond name from. That's one of his original paintings, which she loaned in behalf of her son. So people who you don't think is involved, they are. The Brown family. I want to talk about Mr. Brown, Mr. Eddie Brown and Ms. Yeah. Sylvia Brown. Y'all yeah. don't understand what we got here. Oh, yeah. I sat at the Walters when they were doing a reception of his work. And if some of you went to it, it was a Genesis exhibition that happened a few years ago. It was uh, Jacob Lawrence's work. They had a small exhibition space. It was probably half of this space. And they had his work. And they, was, they were uh, nervous. I'm just there to check out the show, but the people who were giving the show were kind of nervous. Because he gives them millions of dollars. And you know what Mr. Brown said to them? He says, I'm challenging y'all to start showing more African American art, or I may have to reconsider where I support. There you go, mm -hmm. absolutely. So what's happening in the background, we just don't know that glass building y'all drive past at the Maryland Institute? That's because of his efforts. He is the biggest art philanthropist in this area. Understand you wouldn't know him if he was here. That's why he's a quiet warrior. Quiet warrior. We have a lot of those people right here. We got some contemporaries that will blow your mind. I don't know if you don't know uh, Joy Scott. If you don't know Joy Scott, shame on you. <laughs> this woman is larger than life. Every meeting you can name, she's in. She's an actor, she's a singer, she's a whatever, she's a hell of an artist. She, she is known worldwide, humble. Come in here, she'll, she could be on a deaf comedy jam because she's funny too. She would laugh at every one of y'all in here and leave. But she's one of our modern warriors. We have uh, Lauren Cornish. This is my friend. If y'all are down here and y'all drive past his place right up the street that he has managed to hold on to for the last couple of years, Lauren don't charge what he's supposed to charge for his work. We talk, I tease him all the time. He's my big brother. I mess with him every chance I get. <laughs> but this man is a Baltimore legend. He is a genius. This man has mosaic whole buildings. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. He has mosaic entire buildings. Find me somebody else in Baltimore that can do that. 
And he's doing well with his work, but we can do better. I own a small one. Do you? That's the challenge. It's time for us to really put our money where our mouth is. It's time to be willing to share that work. Let's talk about the stakes a little bit, and then I'm going to back away. We all got mad when we found about Mr. William H. Johnson's works being pillaged by somebody and, and, and scavenged by a whole bunch of museums, and now that's the reason why they have the work. We got real upset when we heard about that stuff. That happens every day. Most artists are about the work. They're not thinking about what happens after they leave here. So it falls down on the people that inherit the work. If you inherit the work and there's no roadmap for you, what do you do? <coughs> because you're going to die too. Our kids sometimes are too ignorant to pass the baton, but it's your fault that they're ignorant. My son has been in my studio since he was a baby. He understands fully what's going to happen with this work if something happens to me. There you go. That's what's up. But if she could tell you stories of what it's been like trying to move that forward, all of y'all would be crying in here because there are loved ones attached to each one of these pieces. The legacy of this work is in our hands. Understand that. This has nothing to do with any institution here in Baltimore City. If we can't protect this work, then who will? Right. So I want to thank you for coming out. I jumped around a little bit. My apologies to a few people. Anybody came down to see Mr. Shaw's work. We had a little problem with the lights here at the museum, so it was probably the poorly, poorly lit, lit piece in the whole exhibition. And my apologies to anybody who came out. Anybody that came down to the show and we shifted the dates, well, the storm shifted every schedule, so there were a couple people that came down for the reception. My apologies to you for coming down and not having a, a, we tried our best to get the word out, but a few people slipped through. But other than that, I want to thank you for coming out. I'm looking for part two. I could have did a show with 60 artists, mm. but I couldn't have got 60 pieces. Mm. Mm. What do you think about that? Mm. To me, that's the part that I learned that kind of hurt me a little bit. This piece right here called Rio, there's real people behind these pieces. That's Kevin Brown's mother and that piece by Thomas Stockett. And this piece right here, that beautiful woman standing right there. And she explained to me, her and one of her friends had Torrance do portraits of them. Wow. And I met her daughter through some other people. I came to her house to hang some artwork, and there was a Torrance piece. I freaked out. I almost fell down the steps. Yeah, Torrance, yeah, Torrance, get Torrance from. Get Torrance from. Torrance was the most radical person you would ever meet. I mean, white folks were scared of his work and black folks were scared of his work. That's how powerful it was. Wow. He was doing black heroes before anybody knew anything about black heroes. He was a modern genius. I mean, just, and I hope, I hope that someday we'll see more of his work. So thank you. I'm gonna cut it off. Right you know, I always find it interesting when he starts talking because we don't, he doesn't talk about his work. And, yes. the, and the genius of his work. Yes. Yes. Right. And he said, that ain't my job, so that's my job. Well, I mean, come on now. How many people in here, all right, I'm, 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 I'm going to defend myself a little bit. How many people in here get my emails? All right, my point is, okay, so I'm going to be quiet. It's working. <laughs> But I think the bigger piece is, is how generous he is. So out of all of those children that came today, he gave them all prints. Wow. wow. I got another funny story, and I'm going to leave it alone. OK, so I got. So I can't even give him I, I have to get this out. I have to get this out. It's so important. Go ahead. All right, so I'm in here with over 100 students and about 10 or 15 chaperones and teachers. First question I thought to everybody, including the teachers, is who found it like History Month? Room, room got silent. Teachers were starting to hide behind the students. I hear this little voice in the corner, and he says, you know, I can't remember his name, but I know he selected the time frame because of Abraham Lincoln's birthday and Frederick Douglass's birthday. And from that little boy, 
we was able to get to who the person was, Carter G. Woodson, who was born on my birthday. Or I should say I was born on his birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> but you're also our modern day leader. Yes. And he triumphs. You know, sometimes we don't really, and I have to say this because I can. We've been trying to keep this going here for a long time. <laughs> and one of the things that um, we share is that there is a void in our community. There's a void. Somewhere, we as a people lost our voice. We lost our voice to talk about us in a positive sense. We spend more time doing things that have no relevance to who we are as, as an institution, to maintain our institutions. Frederick Douglass Museum is on that second floor. On that second floor, we celebrate Frederick Douglass, who was a slave working down here in the shipyards going home above a kitchen, a little bitty tiny corner, still trying to learn to read. Escaped from Baltimore after caulking ships. If you look at ships and how big they are, and this little bitty kid caulking ships, it's monumental. We celebrate on the second floor the Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Dock Company. How many of you know what that is? It's the first black shipyard. Let that settle in for a minute. Shipyard. You build boats, you create sails, you, are, you create uh, your blacksmith. You're creating everything that's required to do that. And 15 black men, 15 black men, 15 black men, 15 black men in 1868. I'm going to say that again, because this is powerful. That's the only reason why I'm still down here, y'all, for real. Sixteen folks with Isaac Myers said when all the white tradesmen came from Europe and they took over all the jobs that the free black people had in Baltimore, and the black people said, oh, hell no. We're not going to go out like this. And they, there was a riot. They rioted. This is history. This is history. And when they lost all of that ability to work, they said, look, y'all, we're going to go and get, get, do this. And they went to the basement of Sharp Street and the basement of Bethel Church, and they created that shipyard. And when you look outside and you see all that cement inlay, I want you to look at it before you leave here. You must look at it before you leave here because it's the archaeological footprint of how all those businesses were laid out down here. See? 1868, they raised money out of Baltimore City from black, white, green, whoever was living in Baltimore gave them money to create that business. And they hired people out of this community. Now, I need you to put that in your brain and let that really settle. And fast forward to 2016. There's not a business here, ideal savings and loans. Advanced savings and loans. Where's Fullwood? Where's Osborne Payne? Where's Ken Wilson? And all the people, I, those are the people I knew because when I came, I'm not from Baltimore. So when we sit down and think about looking at our community, why are we looking at 40,000 40, vacant homes? That's huge. That's some deep stuff. And I'm saying all this tonight, we're here celebrating the masters who overcame what they needed to overcome at that time. But I'm going to bring it fast forward because we still have work to do. And the work that they were doing was critical because it made you think about who we really are. And they left their imprint here for you to look at and to think about who we are as a people. What's that legacy for our children? What's that legacy for our children? Everybody's like, you know, I'm old, I'm tired. I'm old. <laughs> Probably 64 years old. We ain't old. We ain't old. We ain't old. We ain't old. The work still needs to be 
done. Our children, how come children come down here to apply for a job and they can't read? Hello? They can't fill out an application. I'm saying all this because I'm going somewhere with it. We have to deal with being involved. We can't sit back anymore. We have to get engaged. All y'all teachers and doctors and lawyers, all y'all professionals, I know y'all know what's going on. Y'all need to come back to the city and we need to take it over and get these kids where they understand that people love them, yes. that yes. they love them, yes. that yes. we love them, yes. and we love them, and we want them to be the best that they can. How are you going to get more masters if they don't even have art? They, can't, they don't even have books. They don't even, they can't write. You know what? This morning. No, wait, I I'm wait, wait, I gotta finish this one thing. Oh, no, 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 I got to say this. I got to say this. I got to say this. No, 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 no. You're not gonna shut me down. We, I know half y'all in here. And I know all y'all know me. But at this point on today, I want you to memorize this day, memorialize it. I want you to go home and I want you to think about what have I done to change this community? What do I have to offer the schools? What do I have to offer the educational system? How am I going to help to build a business? How can I turn North Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue back into what it was or better? Those were our centers of influence, our business centers. These artists were there. All these artists were there and it was thriving. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened to all of our businesses, but we need to make it a mandate, a mandate that we build this community back to its proper position. Thank you all. so important here is that if everybody had a chance to really speak to this subject, this is a passionate subject. Um, am I uh, ranting and raving about black power? No. I'm talking about us recognizing who we are. If you could have saw the, the 200 students that I talked to this, this week, they're eager to learn. You know? And then we, we have to challenge the institutions. Uh, uh, hopefully you're supporting the efforts of the Great Blacks and Wax Museum. Dr. Martin has worked tirelessly. You got the James E. Lewis Museum. They're working tirelessly. Now, you know the Reginald Lewis over there? Yeah. They got a show up right now that I want all of you to see. I want you to see this exhibition. But I also want you to know when you go in there that this woman was a white woman who depicted us in early history in the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Now, I'm not making a white or black issue. I just need you to understand what's there. It, how many people could have been featured during Black History Month at the Reginald Lewis Museum? Right. But the double responsibility is, how many of you have complained that we're not represented, but you've not picketed one time in front of one of those museums? When was the last time you guys said, I want to see more of us represented? But you can't just say it. You got to show up. I've been to all those museums. And it's not just us. I don't want y'all to feel like we're laying the heavy on you. I do, do programs over at Morgan State University. The students have to pass the James E. Lewis Museum to go up to their classes. And when I go to lecture there, the first question I ask them is, what is the exhibition going on downstairs? So the young ones, some of the young ones are jaded, but you got to ask yourself, am I jaded? That's the real question. Because y'all can take all your knowledge to the grave. You got to share it with somebody. So have a good time. Make sure you fill out our list so we can keep you abreast of all the other shows we're getting ready to do. If you get a chance to support us with this catalog, please do. Every little dollar helps us keep programs like this going along. You know, another thing about this, this is free. You know? They charge me $5 a piece to see the exhibition over the Reginald Lewis. And y'all never raised a question about what you saw. Okay? 
Have a good evening. And don't forget to go across so that you can see the founders' room and the artists' renderings of the 15 African American founders of the Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Dock Company. One of the artists is here tonight. Yes. Two of them. Tommy That's Roberts right. did one. Nathaniel did one. Who else? Tom, uh, Jerry Prettyman did one. Yeah, I got Tom. Yeah. So it's three artists here that are represented in the next room. So go in the next room if you like. Can you get a group picture of the four artists that are here? Would you do that for me, please, Mr. Beasley? Tommy, Tommy, come here. Can we get all the artists that are here? This is a very momentous occasion here. I'm really proud to see all these fine artists here uh, in the, of the past. And uh, I hope we keep getting this going, keep this going on. I'll pass this on to my other fellow artists, Nate Gibbs. Wonderful show. <laughs> well, this is a wonderful show. Some of the artists that that's deceased I knew and they were good friends. Okay, my name is Nathaniel K. Gibbs. My name is Tommy Roberts, and um, I'm enjoying this fantastic show. It's a great tribute to all of the great uh, black artists who have passed away. And um, I hope it's the first and annual one daily. Thanks a lot. My name is Jerry Prettyman, and I'm really honored to be at this show. This is a historical event, first time in Baltimore, and I'm just happy to be a part of it. And uh, hopefully we'll keep the ball rolling. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rose McNeil, and I'm here at the exhibit this evening because I received the email from Poncho to come on down to check out the Masters. And I'm so pleased to be here because Baltimore is on the ball. We have one of the greatest artists here who has put this show together, who is, who is talented, who's kind, who has an eye for bringing people together. And I had the opportunity of meeting many of the people who are on display here this evening. And it's just a wonderful thing to see so many people come out. Because without art, I don't know where we would be. Because art is love. And we need to have more love in our communities, in our hearts. And I'm just glad to be here this evening. Thank you. You know, I was really moved tonight after hearing Marsha Jews talk about what's happening in the community. We have so many people who are talented, have so many skills to offer. All we need to do is come together and put our heads together and we can create a movement. I know that years ago, I had a camp for children in the Baltimore area. It was a cultural enrichment camp. I'm willing to get together with a group of people and bring that up. You know, start that over with children, letting them know about their history, letting them know that they are special, and letting them know more about their culture and history. So, I'm inspired. Oh yes, it inspires us. And I'm just fired up and ready to go. Okay, let me know when. Hello, and um, I'm really excited to be here uh, at this art exhibit um, for the masters, uh, artists from Baltimore who have gone on to be with the ancestors. 
It's uh, the work is just phenomenal. I'm just really enjoying watching it. Uh, three of the artists I know, as a matter of fact, two graduated from high school with me: uh, Cornell Barnes and Bill Joyner. And I knew Bobby Torrance way back in the day when I was 21 years old. He was one of my very, very, very good friends. And uh, so. I would not have missed it. I, um, I'm just feeling the spirit of, um, of love in this room from so many people. I'm really so happy to see so many people out too this evening. So many art lovers. I'm an art lover and um, I'm, I'm just so sad to know that my friend Bill uh, passed and I didn't even know it so I just found that out recently. So, I'm just enjoying myself and I'm going to continue to uh, look at the art and enjoy myself and mourn my friend, but, but celebrate my friend. Good evening. My name is Deborah Mason. I am the wife of Pontella Mason, the artist who is exhibited behind me. I have a hard time at this point saying widow. I haven't been able to use that word in relationship to myself because it's only been about two years and because our relationship was a 40-year adventure, there is, it's, it's difficult to say the word widow. Um, my husband was um, one of the premier muralists in Baltimore City. He's done about 35 plus murals. I'll say 35 plus because that's when I stopped counting. He didn't count, he just made sure that I did all of the documentation. So I was blessed to be able to work with him, work with him on a lot of the murals and, and just have been blessed to live an artist's adventure. This is such an auspicious occasion because of the fact that the, artists, the, the Baltimore Masters should be seen in a museum as part of a permanent collection. And I just want to thank Larry Poncho Brown for pulling this together because of the fact that he knows what is lacking in our city and what's important to um, the youth who are our future. And so definitely I'm grateful. I'm grateful to have been, rep um, have my husband represented here. When I speak with other artists who are younger than he, who he has mentored and influenced, I know that he has been a major influence on, on their work as well. So just truly honored to be here. Uh, I, I want to have my son step in here because my children are his creative seed and they carry on in either the visual arts or the performing arts. And I would just love for him to just um, say um, a few words on his opinion about tonight. So can You just gonna leave me? You just... <laughs> um, yeah, this, this, this piece is uh, Sakara about uh, Imhotep, the thinker, the philosopher, the inventor, um, coming to Pharaoh Ramses II about the first step pyramid to go in uh, the Saqqara complex in Egypt on the Nile River, which is, uh, and the, the thing about my father's work, um, I, I'll say uh, around the 2000s, was he was interested in um, trying to tell many stories in one painting, you know? Uh, you, you have uh, the first uh, irrigation here, and you have Imhotep, and you have Ramses, and you have the Step Pyramid, and the gods of Egypt on the, on the columns. And that's really what he was interested in. He was really interested in giving to African-American youth and African-Americans um, a sense of self that didn't come out of a history book. And that's, that's really what I'm going to take with me that's really what uh, my family is going to take with us uh, down the line is that our history is wide and our history is vast and undocumented as, as Poncho said earlier and I think my father made it his work to just shed a little bit of light on the 
pieces that weren't you know quite illuminated and I think this is one of the one of the best this is this is definitely one of the best I hope to hang it in my house one day you know um, yeah just thank everybody for coming and this is a most necessary event honestly good evening my name is Gail Evans and I'm a student at Morgan State University I'm majoring in art I worked alongside Mr. Pontella and Mason and his family on some of the murals that he created and it was an honor and a privilege to have known him and to have studied under him and to have learned so much. This meeting here, the Baltimore Masters, is a wonderful thing to, for this to be the first time and for the large turnout. We have a lot to learn and we have a lot to offer. And I'm so impressed with all the many works that have been done, the kids that have come through and they've learned and they see that it's possible that they can also be a part of the masters. They can be the young masters coming up. And it's such a rewarding experience. And I just love, not just for February, but all year long, we can create and we have created. And to have it displayed in this museum, it's a wonderful event. And I'm sorry that many more didn't come, but I'm glad I came. And I, it was a learning experience. I thank you very much. Hello, Kyla Swinborn. You know, this show is amazing. I have two pieces in it, but the whole, we're all in this show. These, these people are giants. Uh, I, I'm dwarfed by them, but I want to be one of them one day. And uh, hopefully, if I keep working, I will be there. But it's a, it's a beautiful struggle. It's not, even, it's not even a struggle. It's just a beautiful journey. So keep traveling. Hi, I'm Erlene Wilson, and these are my two cousins, and we are here supporting Poncho tonight, but we're really here because we believe in the messaging that he said here tonight that we definitely need to better support our community, our family, each other. It's our responsibility to make sure that this, these wonderful artists work and their message gets passed on and shared and that we continue to support it and support each other. I think it's equally important. My name is Jennifer Yana Harrison. I think it's equally important that our young people be exposed and I understand there were about 200 uh, students from Baltimore City that did come in today so they got an opportunity to look at this art and also to see that all of these artists, artists even though that they're no longer with us that their legacy lives on and I think that is a, a very important imprint to leave with our young people today. It's very inspirational and encouraging. Hi, I'm Paulette Henson and I just need to echo what my sister just stated. Uh, the fact that Poncho brought in so many young people today to see the appreciation of art and I'm just so sorry that I wasn't able to bring my grandchildren here today. Blessed love people. My name is Mel Kutafari and I'm here at the Masters Arts here in Baltimore, Maryland. It's a blessing to be here tonight to witness some master artwork by Baltimore artists here. It's good to be in this environment because as an artist myself, it's good to show the youth, the community, how important art is still, not just here in Baltimore, but worldwide. Um, it's really good to be here and um, that's it. Hello, my name is Kim Jackson, and it's a pleasure to be down here to be uh, a part of this event here at the uh, Maritime Museum here. I'm here with some uh, good friends, and we are uh, good friends of uh, Larry Poncho Brown. We're here to support him and the cause. 
because we need to have more black art and, and history here in Maryland. I'm here with uh, my friend, Paula McNeil, Tracy Melton. We support Larry Poncho Brown wholeheartedly and everything that is centered around black art here in Maryland. Well, I'm Marcia Jews. I curate the art gallery. And um, as you know, Larry Poncho Brown was just genius enough to put in the seed, to plant the seed that we needed to do this master's show, Baltimore's Masters. And I'm just so grateful and everybody's so excited because it's such an important piece. And I'm just grateful to be able to have a couple of pieces in this body of work. And they're both Tom Miller's. And this is a kalimba, and it's called Pisces that Tom did. And it actually is a Pisces fish, and it plays music. It's a kalimba, and you can hear it. And I'm a Pisces, and so it just, it's a perfect, perfect piece of art for me, and red and black are my really important colors for me. And Tom was really important. He's a very funny man. I love Tom. We had a special relationship. And one day I said to Tom, after my dad died, that I really, and I went home, and I came back, and I had one of my chairs when I was a little girl. There were actually four chairs, but there was only one left. I don't know what happened to the other three. I don't know why they weren't in the attic with the last one. I didn't go home much. Home is South Bend, Indiana. But I brought that chair back. When my dad died, I only wanted a couple of things out of my house as a little girl. I wanted my chair. I wanted the blue crock bowl that I ate my popcorn out of. And I wanted the little tiny iron frying pan skillet that I used to scramble my eggs in. And I wanted the yellow mixing bowl that my mom used to mix all of her German chocolate cakes. And so I'm kind of emotional tonight because such an emotional night. It's so powerful. So I called Tom and I said, Tom, I didn't have, everybody was getting all this transformed artwork. And I said, Tom, I really want you to do this piece. I have my chair. And he says, well, Marcia, we need to talk about it. I said, okay. So I took the chair to his house and he said, well, tell me about your childhood growing up in South Bend, Indiana on Bissell Street. And I told Tom, I had curly hair, naturally curly hair, and it just used to curl up and frizz. And I went to church, every Sunday I went to Sunday school, but my mom made me wear a Sunday school hat. I had to wear a hat to Sunday school. And she always had bows on my hair. I had to wear bows, she braided it really nicely, but she put these big old bows on my hair, and I always thought they were so dumb, but I had to wear the bows in my hair. We kind of laughed about that. And the other thing was that my mom and I had a garden out in the backyard, and in the garden, we, I love, still to this day, love, my favorite flower is a tulip. And we had a tulip garden. And in the tulip garden, we also had ladybugs. The ladybugs used to go and get on the tulips in the tulip garden. And outside of my bedroom window, which was in the front of the house, I could look out my bedroom window and we had a big evergreen tree, big conifer. And in there, there were several nests of cardinals. And so I love cardinals. You don't see many here, but there are a few cardinals in Baltimore, but there were lots of cardinals in South Bend back when I was growing up. So one day, Tom called and he says, I have it, I have it. And I said, okay. 
And I went over and it's the Miss Marsha chair. And in this chair is the tulip <laughs> and the ladybug. The little dumb hat I used to wear to Sunday school. The big giant bows that I wore <laughs> on my plaits. And that curly hair that was always so tight and so frizzy. And he said he gave me a big heart because I had a big heart. And this was the last piece. Baltimore Magazine wrote about it. This is the last piece that Tom Miller ever did. And it's the Miss Marsha chair. And I just think it's a privilege and an honor for us to be in here with such a personal story and such a personal piece of art. And that's a personal, I'm a Pisces. And Tom seemed to be able to get into the spirit of everything he did. He found that core, he, he felt that blood rush through it in every piece, from every mural. You can feel it, you can feel his vibration. And I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity to be here and to have these pieces here and to share with the world. And earlier, Pancho Brown was talking about how we have to take all of these masters and all of these pieces and all of our artwork as black people, we've got to share it and we've got to share these stories and we've got to give our legacy to our next generation. And Tommy Stockett is here. And Tommy Stockett, I'm just so tickled about because I worked with him at the Afro. When I first moved to Baltimore, my second job here was at the Afro. And Tommy was editorial cartoonist. And he did all of the editorial work. And also, he was a fine artist. And Tommy had one arm. And the work that he came out with was amazing. And he had, I don't think I ever saw Tommy Stockett frown. He always had a smile on his face. He enjoyed his work. And, and his gratitude and his grace was ever present. And I'm glad you all have an opportunity to hear these stories and to see this astounding work. And I hope you come through this, we're here Mondays through Fridays, 10 to 4, and on Saturdays, 12 to 4. Or you can call, and I'd be glad to meet you here. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Mr. Beasley, for all this great videography that you're doing. Greetings. I'm Salah. I'm here tonight for healing. I am so grateful that Poncho put this show together. I'm here to also explain my 40 years of face painting, which led to me now creating African sculptures. I was introduced in the early 80s to Mother Africa Shrine, where I was also introduced to Fela Kuti and his wives. I was inspired by his wives, who were very strong and spiritual dancers, to paint my face. They had such beautiful paintings on their face that I wanted to do it too. So from that time on, I have been painting my face 30 to 40 years, I will say. Thank you so much and have a blessed evening. I shay, I shay, I shay oh. I just want to say that um, I'm glad this happened today and we are to be accountable for us and our legacy. And it's critical. So we've got really got to be on it. It was a most wonderful, wonderful time, and I just look forward to the next time. My name is Sean, and I'm glad to be here.